Can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, to follow God's word, we're gonna be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I gonna marry? What kind of life am I gonna live? How am I gonna raise my kids? What am I gonna do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Hey, welcome to another week of the choices we face. Uh, Peter Herbeck is back with us again. He's such an important part of the Renewal Ministries team. And we're going to take a look at some video today, Peter, at, at a conference, and, and, and we're going to talk about it. Let's do it. Okay. A friend of mine a few years ago, a long time ago, college actually, it was many, many moons ago. Actually, it was just like four years ago for me, but anyway. <laughs> I'm at this little college, my first college I went to was St. Cloud State, it was called. And I get to college the first day, and I run into... A, a guy who I used to play sports against in elementary school. He was from a little Catholic farming town, I was from a little farming town, and we used to play against each other, and he and I, I'm not bragging, but hey, I mean, we were the two best players in the whole Catholic League. <laughs> you want me to repeat that for you? We were the two, and I think I was, no, never mind, I won't say. His name was Dan. And we always competed against each other. And truth be told, he always got the upper hand because he was a better athlete than me. I was better looking, but he was more better, more athletic. <laughs> well, we didn't see each other all through high school. He went to a public school, I went to a Catholic school, and we end up at the same college. And so we kind of get reunited in our relationship. And I was starting my life at that point, I was beginning to become awakened, to come awake to my faith. And uh, at a certain point through the semester, the second semester during Lent, I, Dan asked me if I was going to do something on Tuesday night. If he, I was busy, I said, well, yeah, I actually have something going. He said, what do you got going? I said, I'm going to confession. There's a communal penance service down at the Newman Center. He goes, confession? Wow, I haven't been for a long time. I said, why don't you come, Dan? Why don't you come? He goes, ah, I don't know, I don't know. Well, I convinced him to come. And here we go, we're sitting down, and uh, the priest comes out. There's a number of priests. Their priest comes out and talks about how, how they're going to do it in the evening. And I'm sitting there. And Dan, Dan's totally quiet. I'm kind of looking at him, and he looks like he doesn't want to be there exactly. And I go to confession. I come back. I needed to really go to confession bad, so it was a great time to go. And I come back, and then Dan gets up and goes, and he comes back. He's just sitting there. And I'm just praying for him. Lord, just touch him, you know. Help him, Lord. And I'm wondering how he's doing. All of a sudden, I hear, and I look, and, I, and he's crying. Oh, wow. Dan was, a, Dan would be, was an All-American football player. He was also a great decathlete. You know, he's like one of the most popular guys on campus and all that. And here he is kind of sniffing. And I'm thinking, Lord, get him, get him. So we go out for pizza afterwards, and he starts opening his heart. And we start sharing our hearts with one another at a whole new level, talking about faith and wanting to follow God. And we're talking about how hard it is as a college student to follow God. And to say, we really want, let's make an agreement to help each other have the Lord be the center of our friendship and our lives. And we supported each other for the rest. I had to leave. I went off to the seminary the next year. So the rest of that year, we supported each other. We had some conversation over the years, but we sort of drifted away. About 10 years later, I'm in my hometown watching a high school baseball game, my old high school, and a kid hits, the home run, hits a home run, and he has the same last name as this friend of mine. And I thought, gee, I wonder if they're related. Turns out they're related, and his mother is my friend's sister, and she happens to be at the ballpark. So I go to her, and I said, how is Dan doing? She goes, yeah, he just lives up near the Twin Cities, and he's a, di he's a, a, a chiropractor. He's got this hugely successful practice. He's doing really well. I bet he'd like to see us. So give me his phone number. So I call him. He said, yeah, Pete, come on by. So I go to his house, and he's got this big, gorgeous house on a lake, like three-story thing, you know, three descending decks going down to the water. He's got all kinds of boats and toys. He looks like he did when he was 20, you know, just perfectly athletic and all this. And so we're talking. I said, Dan, you know, so what, what have you been doing with your life? And he said, uh, 
He said, oh, Pete, life's been great. You know, he said, I, I hit my five-year plan, literally two years, 10-year plan, three years. He said, we've got all kinds of clinics developing. Things are great, you know, and I feel good. I'm looking, you know, and I said, yeah, you look good, friend. And, I, and he kept talking about all the things he's doing. And after a while, I said, hey, Dan, let me ask you a question. How does Jesus fit into all this? And he, he kind of stopped cold, and he looked at me. He goes, well, you know, Pete, I've been, I've been busy. I thought, uh-oh. And he says, well, really, Pete, I'm on a spiritual quest. And then I really went, uh-oh. I said, what's the spiritual quest? He goes, you know, I, like I, I was out in Colorado doing a sweat lodge with some other guys, some guys from Wall Street a month ago, and we walked on red-hot coals, and we, we saw, like, spirits, you know, in, 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 you know, and all this. I said, what? And I said, Dan, what happened to Jesus Christ? He looked at me, he said, Peter, I, I don't know what happened. He said, life just kind of was busy and one thing led to the next. And I, I was fighting back tears, I felt so bad. And I said, Dan, I was there when Jesus Christ touched your heart. I was there when you were beginning to follow him. I was there, you remember when we said to each other, let's run the race to the end, let's do this. Jesus Christ is what really matters. I said, Dan, it's just sad. I mean, I'm glad you have three big decks and you know five boats and all that kind of stuff, but it's really sad to me that you've, you've lost the pearl of great price somehow. And it was just a moment of quiet and big time awkwardness <laughs> at that moment. We said goodbye, and I, I drove to the airport and flew home. About six months later, I'm at my desk and I'm going through business cards, and I'm throwing away old business cards, and I come across Dan's card. And I felt like the Lord said, I just felt a prompting say, call him. So I call his house, and his wife answers. I said, hi, Becky, how are you? Is Dan around? She goes, she goes, no, he's not, but I'll tell you what, he's at the clinic. Call him right now, because I know he's going to want to talk to you. So I get him on the phone at the clinic, and he says, Herbs, I gotta tell you, I'm so glad for that conversation. He said, what? He goes, man, I, I was lost. He said, I've come back to the Lord, I've come back to church, I've been leading two Bible studies with local businessmen in my, in my community. He said, I'm taking uh, groups of people from my hometown on missions to Africa. He's kind of going through all this stuff. We bought a farm, uh, a barn for youth outreach for all the high school kids in the area, and that brother got set on fire, and what he realized, what he realized, friends, is he took his eye off the prize, and he got sucked into the vortex of the world. I got to be successful. I got to be powerful. I got to look awesome. I got to be with the right people. I got to be cool. I got to multiply my possessions, and it became about him and not about Christ. And to this day, he's still successful at what he does, but he emptied himself of the ego that was in him, and he took on Jesus' priorities. What, did, what does Philippians 2 tell us? He emptied himself, took on the form of a servant. And what was awakened in Dan again was to say, oh yeah, it's not about me. It's not about God doing stuff for me so I can have the life I want. It's about me becoming God's servant like his son Jesus, so I can be an instrument through being obedient to God's call in my life, an instrument of salvation for those around me. Amen? Amen. That's you, too, and that's me. And we have a culture and a pattern of life that militates against that now. Humility, lowliness, emptying yourself, radical obedience to Jesus. Right where we are today, Jesus wants us to hear him. And he's here with love and compassion, with his power. And he's saying to you, I'm here today, I want you to give me your fears, your anxieties, your shame, your brokenness, your hypocrisy, your timidity, your ego, your idols. I want you to put your idols at my feet. 
so that I can bring in you, I can bring you to life in a new way with new power and a new capacity. And whatever walk of life you're in, we have testimonies coming after my talk today. Stephanie and Bob. Stories of two people, two ordinary people, both in their own way, who really did empty themselves, but God had to bring them to a place where they were willing to let go and to trust God. And I want you to listen closely to them to see the amazing thing God has done in their lives because they gave him permission and they said, I want you now to be first. You don't work for me anymore, I work for you. I exist now to please you, that's my passion. I heard a great story just a few years ago. Let's see, it says I have six, 63 minutes left, it says. Is that what it says? No, six minutes and 20 seconds, sorry. A friend of mine told me a few years ago, remember when the Baltimore Ravens won the Super Bowl? And they had Ray Lewis and a bunch of guys on that team, and they had John Harbaugh as the coach. John's a strong Catholic. He's on fire. He said his number one passion is that I want to be a man without guile before God. That's what he said. But they had a bunch of Christian men on that team. Catholics and Protestants, they said, we want this to be a different kind of team. Yeah, we want to win a Super Bowl. We want to be the best we can be, but we want to love each other. We want to be brothers. And they had a couple of coaches and some of the key players. Matt Burke, who was the captain of the team, was the center, went to Harvard. Catholic boy, raised in St. Paul, Minnesota. His faith had come alive, and he was there as a spiritual leader. He was in retirement. The coach convinced him to come out of retirement, to come to play for him, to be that pillar and that leader on the team with a number of other guys. Well, they went through, and I heard stories afterwards of an amazing year they had together because they decided to put Jesus Christ at the center of their enterprise together in their work and their career in that year. And they helped each other. One of the key coaches on the team was like a spiritual leader for the whole team. And he said to Coach Harbaugh the week of the Super Bowl, and he said, you know, after the game, we need to do something. This is going to be the end of the year either way, to do something to honor the Lord. Coach said, whatever you feel like the Lord wants you to do, do it. So they win the Super Bowl. And of course, everybody's watching, and it's such an amazing thing, and they come in the locker room, and all the journalists are there, and everybody's, you know, talking about them, and you guys are amazing, you guys are amazing, you know? After a while, they get the journalists out, the coach comes in with a cross, and he put the big cross on the floor, and they took that trophy, that glass trophy, for the Super Bowl trophy, and they came, and they knelt down, and they put it at the foot of the cross. And they knelt around that cross. And they said, Lord, it's not about us, it's about you. Even in this moment, we thank you for it, but we want to empty ourselves. And we want you to know you're the prize. You're the gold. You're the pearl of great price. You did something special with us. And we thank you for it. Not that we won, that's not what they're talking about. You did something special with us you formed us into a brotherhood and taught us how to love each other in a deeper way in this year. That's emptying ourselves. That's giving ourselves to him and putting first things first. Today's a day I think it would be good for all of us to take stock of where we are. But Peter, you know, that, that was just really inspiring because it's so easy for anybody, whether they're successful in business or successful in football or not, just a little by little, let their life get gobbled up by other things just to drift right. away. A lot of people don't start by saying, I'm going to reject Jesus and choose the world. Right. They just say, oh, the world's offering me this. Oh, the world's offering me this. Oh, this is being demanded of me. That's being demanded of me. And before you know it, you're kind of filled your life with something else other than Jesus, and you sort of forget about him yeah, yeah. W without no ill intent. But, but what you have done, in fact, is drift away from the source of life and the one who loves us and yeah. the one who can really give meaning to our life. I'm, as you're speaking, I'm just thinking of the, the different kinds of teaching, both from Jesus and the apostles, the sower, the seed. Remember the among thorns? It starts to rise up, but it gets choked off by all yeah. the concerns and all the things of the world. 
it's so prescient even now. Yeah. And, and it's so easy to be distracted now. There's just so many things in our society, you know, constant 24-7 phones and media galore. And I think a lot of people don't have time for the Lord. Not, not like they said, I'm not going to have time for the Lord. Yeah. It's just like my life just gets all filled up. Yeah. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, seek first. Yeah. Seek first. And if we don't seek first, we're not going to keep growing. We're not going to keep growing. Instead, we're going to drift into, what is, is it First John where he says, you know, things like the lust of the eyes yeah. and the pride of life yeah. and the world and its glitter looks really attractive mm -hmm. and, you know, gifted talent. People say, I want that. I want that. Mm -hmm. I want that. And before you know it, as John says there too, you become a friend of the world. Yeah. And guess what he says about friends of the world? I know. Friendship I know. with the world is enmity with God. Yeah. You make yourself like an enemy of God. That is the friendship with that energy that's in the world that is resisting God and resisting acknowledging God and that kind of yeah. thing. You get caught up into that. You can see it now. It's happening in our culture like crazy now in a very significant way with real fundamental biblical issues that God's plan kind of issues are, are in play and just huge swaths of society are just kind of drifting and kind of genuflecting. And so the, the image, the reason I told the story about the Baltimore, Col the Baltimore Ravens there was that, I mean, they took, you know, the NFL is like, the top of the food chain, you know what I mean? And, the, and the, it's, the, it, people worship it like God. Yeah, really. You know, really. Certainly, it gets a little too far for sure. Yeah. And so here, these brothers are. They've got the crystal. They got the crystal football. You know, everybody wants, and they put it at the feet of the cross. I mean, it's a symbolic gesture, and they wanted to express to the Lord. Lord, we know the gold that you really gave us. The real trophy was you being with us and helping us this year have brotherhood together and treat yeah. each other better and talk to each other better and help each other. Yeah. When we're needed, I, f I felt like it was very powerful and I was moved by it when I heard it, Ralph, because I heard John Harbaugh talk coach, about it on yeah. the YouTube, the coach, was that um, I kind of felt like all our idols and our crowns are going to be thrown, the crowns of this world, at the feet of the king. Mm -hmm. And they were doing it. And that's yeah. just so cool. It's just so wonderful. No, it really it's so, is. It's so true, you know? And, and every one of us is being challenged to the same thing, yep. to keep straight what's the most important thing and never let go of it. And that, that scripture passage you mentioned, Matthew chapter 6, let's just look at that a little bit more. Yeah. It's a parallel passage, Luke chapter 12. You know, Jesus says, the unbelievers are always going to be worried about these things. So it's, it's, it's almost a sign of lack of faith. You know, yeah. your, your faith diminishes and you start be feeling like, gee, it's, it's up to me, you know, nobody's looking out for number one, you know, I've got to really go after this. And it creates this. worry and anxiety yeah. and yeah. tension. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of panic in those moments. Like we end up, yeah. the devil comes along and tempts us yeah. when we're kind of worried yeah, he all the time. holds something out to us and we say, oh, okay. That's what I need. Okay, yeah. boom, I'm going to go get yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Jesus says, you know, unbelievers are always worried about what they're going to eat, what they're going to wear, what the future is going to bring. Jesus says, you know, your worry can't add a single second to your life or a single centimeter to your height. You know, it's just, this is a gift you have and you have to recognize it. And so I say to you, I say to you believers, seek first the kingdom of God and his holiness and the other things will be added to you because your father knows you need these things. Now, this is not the prosperity gospel, but this is an amazing and wonderful promise that if we trust the Lord, if we have him at the center of our life, if we're making the, the, the deepest kind of drive of our life to seek first the kingdom of God and his holiness, he's going to give us what we need to carry out the mission for which we've been created. If we need a Cadillac, we'll get a Cadillac. If we need to have good health so we can walk somewhere, we'll have good health. If we don't need good health, we're going to get what we need to carry out the whole purpose for which we've been created, which is an amazing promise. And when, when Ann and I first got married, you know, a long time ago, uh, that, that passage in Luke chapter 12, the parallel to Matthew 6, was really like the center of our life. You know, we didn't have any money. I didn't have a good job at the time. We, you know, we didn't really know what was going to happen, you know, and we just really knew that that was a word that Jesus was, a promise that Jesus was making to us. I have to tell you, it's been absolutely true. And even to this day, there's temptation sometimes to, sure. to not live that way. But uh, our hope is in the name of the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and yes. earth. And he has the cattle on 10,000 hills, and he's able to provide what we need to carry out the mission Amen, of brother. Our life. Amen. You know, I probably mentioned this to you at some time in the past, but I, men I mentioned going from St. Cloud State to uh, the seminary. Mm -hmm. That yeah. first year in the seminary, I, I was beginning to read the Bible every morning and meditate on it. 
and Matthew 6 I was reading one mm. day, 633, and it said, seek first the kingdom of God, the very quote, you know, and his way of holiness and everything will be added to you. And I felt it was one of those moments where it's like the passage jumped out at me. It came, it was almost like highlighted or something. This is for you. This is for you. Yeah. And it came right into my heart. I felt like the Lord said, I promise you, Peter, because I'm trying to discern, should I be here in the seminary? Should I not? What should I do? I felt like he just said, put that away right now. What you need to do is seek me first, because you won't get the clear answer until your emotions and your mind and your heart and your will are aligned with mine in the way that I want them to. So I felt like he said, I promise you, if you make this like your life passage, and I wrote that in my journal, I will show you and I will prove to you that my word is true. And I mean, you just, it was at the beginning of your life yeah. and marriage. It, you know? it's, it's our life passage. Yeah, it's but, interesting, you know, isn't it? It needs to be the life passage of every Christian. It really does, you know no matter what's pressing on you, no matter what concerns you have, no matter what worries you have, what you mainly need to do is to seek first the kingdom of God and his holiness, and the answers will come when the answers need to come, and if they don't need to come, they won't come, but you can completely trust the Lord that if you put him first in your life, the secondary things are gonna take their rightful place. And I think the, the last thing Jesus says there all things will be added unto you. The father, your, and then the, your father knows what you need. Yeah. That whole theme, Jesus is trying to tell us a fundamental tru truth, not to just give us some kind of emotional consolation. Right. He really wants us to know the truth. Yeah. And then uh, if we don't come to know Jesus as the, the value, the pearl of great price, yeah. then everything in the world glitters in a way that's not quite real, right? right. And, but once you, once you receive the pearl, once you really encounter Christ and know his love and he changes your life, all of a sudden, the, the glasses you have now that you're seeing the world, they're totally different. Yeah. You don't hate the world or anything like that, no. but you know what's, what's counterfeit, yeah. what's not real, what's not really going to help me, and what in the world is beautiful that God yeah. has given us to, yeah. given to us. You yeah. know? So what does it mean, Ralph, to say, do you think, the pearl, to receive the pearl of great price? I, th I, think, I think that means to say, if you could only understand that what's being given to us in God's beloved son, Jesus, is, is the most amazing, valuable, precious, relevant, life-changing gift you could ever imagine. And what I think about is that short statement of what it's all about, John chapter 3, verse 16. And we used to see guys running around in football stadiums, you know, <laughs> with, with the John 3, 16. Well, what John 3, 16 says is the heart of everything. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. What a, what a thing for God the Father to do, give his only son, so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. What, what, what that's revealing to us is that something's really at stake. Like we, we, we are lost, we have problems, we are deeply in need, and no matter how much money people have, they're gonna die. Yeah. They're gonna die. And Jesus says, if you die in your sins, you're, you're lost forever. And so what's being offered to us is the gift of cleansing, the gift of forgiveness of sin, and not only that, the gift of eternal life. And you know, all these, you know, European explorers were going around the world looking for the fountain of youth. You know, they were, they were going to Florida, they were looking for it in Florida, they didn't find it. The fountain of youth, the eternal youthfulness, the eternal health, the eternal well-being that everybody's seeking for is found in Jesus Christ in the resurrection from the dead. Jesus' broken body on the cross came forth victorious on Easter morning, and he's saying, I'm gonna take you through death. If you come, if you come with me, I'm gonna go with you through death, and I'm gonna bring you to a life that you can hardly imagine, where there's no more suffering, no more tears, and, and yeah. it's, it's eternal life, what a gift. I mean, I mean you, gotta, you gotta sell everything you have to have that. You gotta make every sacrifice you can, you gotta make every hard decision you can to, to have that, because that's the only thing worth having that's gonna make an eternal difference. And that's how the math really works. That's the math. You know, people are making, you know, they're va valuing things and making evaluations all the time about yeah. what's truly valuable, what's not valuable. And sometimes they think, gee, if I become a Catholic, am I trading up or down, you know, yeah. from where I am right now? That kind of yeah. whole mindset. Yeah. They're thinking about, like, in terms of religion, you know, do I need religion in my life? No, you need Jesus Christ in your yeah. life. You need a savior. You need someone to bring you, you need him to bring you to the, the fundamental meaning of your life. And then when you, when you receive the pearl yeah. and your heart falls in love with him, you're going to understand what the church is. Yeah. Until then, it's just going to be some kind of a religion. But when your heart falls in love with Christ, you're going to love what he loves. And you're going to see that the, the church is his body, and that you're part of his body, and that the sacraments are giving life-giving love 
and healing to you, and it all, it all flows, though, from that first yeah, amen. important decision. Well, Peter, I have the great joy and delight not to take a break, but to continue the preaching with your new booklet. It's called Light in the Darkness, and uh, what a relevant booklet for our time. There is so much darkness, and yet there's a, an amazing light that's shining in the middle of the darkness that wants to actually be permanently in our life, radiating light from us so we can be a light in other people's darkness. We're going to tell you how to get this booklet, and when we come back, I'm going to ask Peter to kind of give a closing little exhortation for us. Friends, we're living through difficult and challenging times. The church is in a fierce battle. In the words of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, man is pushing God from the human horizon, and as a result, the light which comes from God is disappearing, and humanity is losing its bearings. In this moment, it's crucial that we hear the words of Jesus who said, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I wrote this short booklet to help you lay hold of this precious promise from Jesus so you can have the strength and the courage you need to be a light in the darkness. To order your free copy of Light in the Darkness, you can go to RenewalMinistries.net or call 1-800-282-4789. Well, Peter, you know, we only have a short time left, but uh, why don't you just kind of speak right from your heart to the hearts and minds of those who are watching and listening. As you were so eloquently and passionately rejoicing in the gift of eternal life, this passage came to my mind from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 and following. It says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer body is wasting away, our inner man is being renewed every day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That's what we've been talking about at the end of this program, friends. Jesus is the pearl of great price because that glory is in him. He became one of us so he could share with us what belongs to him. He's going to give us a share in his own glory, his transformed life, perfect life, perfect joy, perfect love, eternity in and joy and, and happiness beyond all compare. That's what he's giving to us. Do the math on that. Yeah. So think about that. The saints tell us, the apostles tell us, don't forget that. Think about it every morning when you get up. Think about it when you go to bed at night. And it helps order our lives and walk through this life without, without having to be, come under the pressure of the world and be worried and anxious. We can be elevated above it knowing where we are headed. Yeah. Peter, what a deal. Oh, it's yeah, what the a best. deal! It's a, it's amazing. We 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 deserve to be lost forever and dead forever, and we're getting the free gift of eternal life. If the we, eternal lotto, we hit the eternal lotto. Right? Oh man, <laughs> man, we've heard the gospel message. We've discovered how to have eternal yes, life. You yeah. know, it's just tremendous. So anyway, thanks so much today for the tremendous things you've shared, and thank you for being with us again. Uh, and keep on seeking God and His holiness, and the other things will be added.